All right, let us begin with the afterword, which begins with some words about words, language, words, the power of words. Right, Anna? What do they let us do? Yeah, I thought you had a powerful quote about what words do in terms of naming who and what we lose. Anaya also had a powerful quote from the same page, name the masters of broken earth. Whoa, why Anaya? The power of language. So we begin with this power of words, power of language to name things, give names to things, the crucial role of language and justice. I do love that you drew attention to this quote, which is actually a quote from Catherine Yusuf in a book called A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None. What a title. I've always wanted to read this book. I have no idea what's in it, but what a title. Amazing. I wish I could write a book just with that title alone. I think you should just get an award. It's not even that much. You can buy it for like three bucks on a Kindle, so... Go get it. <laughs> At the same time, our authors then turn our attention to how words can seem meager, impotent, not very effective against, what did they say they are, were not very effective against the guiding forces of extractive industries and the endless horizons of toxic legacies. We saw those signs, we are not pests, and yet the words which were seemed so effective didn't work. Right, Zeke? <laughs> What's the other thing about words and the, uh, the other creatures out there? They don't translate. And then there's the problem of those creatures that you know, it doesn't translate. It may not even speak. What should we do about those? We can make spaces in which to recognize them. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So, we have lives that can perceive what we call justice in ways that do not translate. We can make spaces in which to recognize them. I guess that's kind of what this book is about, maybe. Giving us the example, spaces in which to recognize these alternate creatures. Slime Mold Andy, for example. Autumn, you seem to like this slime mold. Why? It doesn't seem like it's answering questions that people are asking on Twitter. But it's just interesting to think that slime doesn't have a brain, doesn't have a mouth, but it um, uses chemical signals and either like nutrient signals or, um, and it seems to go to letter, different letters, supposedly answering the question. It answers the question. It does not have a lot of followers, Slime Mold, nor does it follow too many. However, notice that even Kirksey, and I think that's the author of Rodent Trapping, is a follower. I have not started following Slime Mold Andy myself. I will admit, though, that I did go down a little bit of a rabbit hole on looking at Slime Molds, not just Slime Mold Andy. You can use Slime Mold to do all kinds of things. Andy was asked, what do you think about the sixth mass extinction by Nina Lester Finley? We may as well find out.
skyrocket, soapstone, any chance, WB, and so I Now, you might think, what? That's not an answer. But in fact, interpretation of it, it was pretty good. So like I said, I went down a little bit of, well, it's interesting to use the word rabbit hole, as you'll see in a second. So and Finley's interpretation, this last part, you can read the interpretation, the first part yourselves, was, you know, it's about the microbials are starting to fight back, or they could, because they are the flattering undersoil. They're becoming resolute. They will withstand extinction far more easily than will humans, which is true. I also like this last part. You know, the, remember the last word. That's right. Thank you, Andy, for your words of warning. We are not hares. We can all not survive on grass. We need the flattering undersoil to survive. Right, Cass? We need that flattering undersoil, don't we? Isn't that what you're studying? The flattering undersoil? Sort of? Yeah. He said this book was better than you thought it would be. Yeah, it definitely makes you think. Thank you, put this quote that it, would, it teaches us that we could be entangled. Andy certainly teaches us how we can be entangled in shared cosmopolitan worlds better than you thought. I have to admit, at some points, reading about Andy the Slime Bowl, I want to not like it. I want to say, what? This is nuts. This is just wasting my time and the time of other weird academics. And it seems like art, and I don't like art. So I'm tempted to not be into it at all. And sometimes the words were too big. Even there, entangled. Cosmopol, what? I don't know. However, I would say at the end, I drew three main lessons. As we started to read a little bit deeper into the afterword, I think they are lessons that we can take with us for at least the summer, if not after we graduate, for those of you who are graduating. The first lesson is to the importance of play. To play, and that is what perhaps Andy is doing and others is playing. This whole paragraph on page 235 is, is great. I can't figure out where to start it. I'll start it here. Play is a mode in which to test limits, to practice common forms of life, and to probe the edges of them, experimenting and innovating. Whether as a rambunctious wrestling session or an artistic experiment with unfamiliar life forms, play is practiced for the necessities of living, thinking, moving, caring, standing ground, and feeling out the edges of shared worlds. So I think the importance of play 
is an, a good lesson for us. Actually, Liz, does this sound familiar? The importance of play? I know you didn't write about it, but I'm hoping it sounds familiar from some other class that you're taking. Ritual play. In another class, in another book that we're reading, they talk about the importance of the zone of play for trying to experiment with things and that so many of our inventions that we like, like the steam engine was invented with in ancient Greece, but they use it to open doors and make it look like magic. So many of the things that we like now were invented because of playfulness. I also like this because, of course, play has to do with something Lewis does a lot, which is the music part, which is the one art form which is completely, I don't know, it's one of the art forms that is completely wordless, or it can be, and so it goes beyond that linguistic representation. It gets us beyond language. We're supposed to feel it, not necessarily, uh, or it's directly felt. Which leads us to the sexual lesson, which they actually use this word, which is, well, at the end of the play part, they say arenas for play can serve as learning grounds for recognizing when to rise up and fight or when and how far and fast to run, to run away, to become a fugitive, to get out of there. And they talk about that in some ways people celebrate fights for justice. Maybe we should also think about flights for justice, that sometimes you can't fight, you just have to run to get out of there. Again, it relates to something that, a book I'm teaching in the other class where they talk about the fundamental freedoms, of the freedom to move, be able to leave somewhere to migrate, and the freedom to disobey, to ignore or disobey orders that you're given, fundamental to freedoms. And they say here that fugitivity Fugitivity is a strategy long lived and practiced in black, queer, Latin American, Asian, and indigenous lives and writings. Now you might be wondering to yourself, or actually I'm wondering to myself, what if you don't identify with any of those communities? Can I practice fugitivity? I would say, I guess there's a lot of times that I've wanted to be, get out. <laughs> but if you find yourself in a privileged position, I would say, you may need to stay. In fact, if you leave the country, let us say, you end up becoming one of those annoying expats somewhere else, being a bothersome person. So sometimes, if, you're, if you find yourself in a state of privilege, you may need to stand your ground so that others can flee around you, so that others can leave. And I guess I would say, don't be get down on other people's rights to leave and to move and to disobey. Don't be mean. So that's my lesson. Third lesson. <laughs> Catastrophic times call for catacrestic idioms. Hmm, that one's not so simple because I didn't know what that word meant. So I had to look it up. Catacrestic, crestic, seems to be ways in which people use words incorrectly. And the grammarians get down on people for catacresis. But sometimes you need it to shake people up. 